Today we're talking about film festival. That adds color to the story. Welcome to Butter City, the show all about filmmaking with a Minnesota twist. Today we have Robert Bird, a phenomenal filmmaker and producer who's won many awards um, and is currently now working with the Jerome Foundation. And welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thanks Good for being on be the here. show. Great I'm to be here. Excited to have you. I know you've been making films for a really long time. Yeah. And uh, as I was kind of researching stuff, you got your start. I mean, it must have been like, like 20... 20 years ago? Yeah, I, I hate to think of how long ago it was, but it was in the 80s, yeah. Okay, and, and um, some of your first films you came out of, was it, uh, what was the cable company you came out of? Well, it was called Continental Cable, okay. uh, and it was actually not far from where you are here in St. Paul. It was in the uh, Union Depot. Uh, it, was, um, uh, it was an unusual sort of experiment in cable television. It, it provided all of the same things that cable TV did, all of the uh, various services, but they also did a lot of their own local origination programming. So they had a big studio, yeah, and they produced lots of shows. Um, and that's where I got my start, doing documentaries. So now were you working, I know you worked with the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union. Mm -hmm. Were you working there at the same time or was, no, how no. did that overlap? I was the associate director of the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union and, but, and I was there for about four years. Uh, and uh, the director, a very colorful man named Matthew Stark, actually I think had uh, the, intended to make me the director of the organization someday. Uh, but my love was, has always been production, and it was back then. And so I announced to him one day that I was leaving, and he got pretty upset. But <laughs> I left and went to uh, Continental. Uh, it was interesting how I got in. Um, Randall Coleman, who was the, uh, the CEO of Continental at the time, uh, was this you know, pretty powerful guy in the world of, in the community of cable television of the Twin Cities. And I called him out of the clear blue and invited him to lunch. Didn't really think he'd say yes, but he did. And when he came to lunch, I spent uh, about an hour and a half lobbying him to hire me, <laughs> even though I had absolutely no experience. <laughs> it worked out well. He did hire me. My first day on the job, they put a camera in my hands. I had no idea what to do with it. And uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> but I taught myself uh, pretty quickly how to use it. And uh, I'd say within the first year, I did my first documentary, which won the highest award that cable could convey at the time. And from there, I just started doing more work. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I mean, there had to be something. I mean, what do you think it was that let him be like, yes, I'm putting a camera in his hands, even though I know he does not know how to use that? I think he saw something in me uh, through my level of passion that suggested to him that, uh, you know, I would be a good asset for uh, his organization. He's a CEO. That's what he does. You know, he, he, he has to have that sixth sense to know whether some, a decision he makes will ultimately benefit his organization. And it did because uh, nearly every documentary I did uh, was highly visible and, and gave the organization a good name. I, I don't want to, I'm not boasting. I mean, it, uh, they won lots of awards and uh, did quite well. And he was happy. And at one point he told me, look, you need to just leave and go to California and, and uh, uh, try to create a career for yourself there. This marketplace is too small for you, you should leave. And I didn't, I stayed. Uh, I eventually ended up in New York for a while, but uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a firm believer in me and what I did. Well, something that I think you are able to do in your filmmaking is you, um, you digest information, you digest stories, I, th I think on many different levels. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were in New York and you were working on Generation Q, mm -hmm. um, that piece is is an example to me in that in the way that you're able to take something that's very current that people have politicized um, and talk about it on a, a level up here, but you're able to kind of bring it down 
to this level, system. not down like isn't down lower, right. but like on this level that is much more expansive. Right. Um, just so I'm going to let it speak for itself, but let's take a look at this clip from Generation Q. Okay. House Bill 3353 is an amendment to an existing student rights law in Massachusetts. It's a law that prohibits discrimination in public schools on the basis of sexual orientation. It was a bill that in fact added sexual orientation to the docket of race, creed, you know, religious background, and made sure that no matter who you are, um, that your rights would be protected as a student. This bill is, is fighting for equality. It's not, um, you know, being safe in, in schools is not a special privilege, it's a right. That's a mean looking thing, it's kind of red. Tell us about that. Well, it was, uh, it was a student in the high school, punched me. Uh, I think it was on account of his prejudice, actually, because uh, he, he just couldn't uh, accept my homosexuality, and he, he uh, gave me a sucker punch. Can you explain his behavior? I realize you're not a psychiatrist, but how, why do you think he did that? Well, basically, um, many high school kids don't really know other gay people. And they're just going to want to, you know, hit the first fag that comes along. And they do, because the teachers aren't there to, you know, support us or protect us when we need it. Bills written on paper initially aren't going to affect straight youth, or straight youth have to interact and see uh, these gay kids in their school and have to deal with them and talk to them and realize that they are people. The goal of this entire law is to just make it, make a public education accessible to all students. Uh, and that includes straight students who are perceived to be gay, anyone who's harassed because of their sexual orientation or because of what people think their orientation is, is uh, in effect being robbed of their public education. It's, it's not in any way promoting kids or anyone to identify themselves in a certain way. It's simply trying to make schools safe for people that do identify themselves as, as gay or lesbian or bisexual. It empowers teachers, first of all, to talk about gay and lesbian issues in class, to say that, you know, this person or that person a poet or, or a writer was gay. It allows students to bring same-sex partners to the prom. It just allows them to be out and open and feeling good about themselves and knowing that they're protected and that they feel safe. So, <laughs> Robert, that's, I mean, I think that's an, a stunning example of how you do this sort of, you take these big stories but you bring them down to this this personal level. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, do you remember when you were interviewing those kids what you were thinking? Uh, well, I always aspire to, to really bring out the humanity of people because I think that the one thing we all have in common is our humanity. Even the people that we don't particularly care for have humanity. Uh, and I'm struck by, you know, I was struck by uh, a young man I interviewed some time ago for a piece on hate that I did while at uh, TPT, a half hour documentary. And he was pretty well known in the Twin Cities at the time. I can't remember, his first name was David, but he was uh, a neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. And I went to his home to uh, interview him, and when my crew and I went in, we saw all of these guns all over the place, and, and we're a little nervous. The cameraman said, I don't know if I want to be here, but I said, let's just be calm. and. Mm -hmm and do what we came here to do. And one of the first things this person told me, even though I knew that he hated me because of who I was, was that he respected my work because uh, he's seen a lot of my work and that I always seem to respect the subjects that appeared in the work. So I was really struck by the fact that a neo-Nazi <laughs> would say something like that to me. But in a way, it was a, it was a complimentary thing because it was true. I aspire to respect everyone and to reveal their humanity, because that's what we all share. That's what we all have in common. Well, I know one of the things that I was really excited about having you on the show was Generation Q was a film that I saw when I was young and I was coming out. And it really shaped the way that I was able to talk about kind of the bigger picture of where I was and um, how to relate to other people. 
Like it really helped in that way, and it helped generate conversations. I would show the video to other people, and and I know that that's a piece too of every filmmaker wants their work to be used, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's a piece of of the work that you do. Mm -hmm. I, is that sort of? Do you have? Any, I know you have. You've done a lot of work with a lot of different communities, and there's got to be you know other stories like well, that. Well, I have two stories actually. Uh, a piece I did uh, at Continental uh, called Torture the Shadow of a Beast uh, was, I, I did the piece after reading about the Center for Victims of Torture that opened here in, in, in Minneapolis near the university, which was one of only three such centers in the world. The other, was, the other two were in Copenhagen and Toronto. So I spent a lot of time talking to people who were victims of torture. And the piece actually premiered on the Discovery Channel. Uh, and it also, um, uh, aired on uh, public television. When it aired on the Discovery Channel, I got phone calls and letters from all over the country. And one of the phone calls that really struck me the most was from a psychiatrist in New Orleans who said that he had a patient who had been from mental health worker to mental health worker and no one could help this person. And he said, you know, I, I was at the point of wanting to give up on him as well because I just didn't know what what his issue was, and he was just so closed off to, to opening up uh, to me. And he said, but he came into, running into the office the other day saying, I just saw something on television that was all about me. And he said that he opened up in ways that he never had before. And for the first time, he felt that he could help this man. And he said he discovered that he had been the victim of severe child abuse. And in fact, I got phone calls from people all over the country who had been child abuse victims who saw themselves as torture victims, even though th the documentary was about people who had suffered political torture uh, in third world countries mostly. And so I realized through that phone call from the psychiatrist in New Orleans the power of documentaries. But there's also another story. I did a piece uh, called Invisible to the Eye about uh, a young Hmong mon boy who at age three had been severely burned in a house fire, burned off his face and his hands. And he, you know, other children viewed him as a monster because he didn't resemble a human being in the way that they were accustomed. And even adults, I'd go out with this kid in, in public and wherever he went, everyone stared. That was his life. And he was like an old soul trapped in a young body because he had to grow up much faster than people his age. But when the documentary was done uh, and had aired several times on national public television, uh, his mother called me and invited me over to lunch one day. And I went over. And there was a, a man there in his 20s uh, who had befriended Fua, the young boy. And Fua was around 13 at that time. And uh, so I met this guy. And, it turned out that he had just come to the Twin Cities from some other place. He saw the documentary on television and decided that he wanted to try to be like a big brother to Fua. And so his mother screened him and liked him, and, and he did, in fact, become a big brother. And when we were, when we were having lunch, uh, he said, you know, like three quarters of the way through the lunch, Robert, uh, we hate to run, but Fua and I have to go because we have to go to the Mall of America. And I said, well, why do you have to go there? And he said, because uh, Fua has to buy a present. And I said, a present? Who does he have to buy a present for? And he said, his girlfriend. And I said, Fua, you have a girlfriend? And he was really shy, and he admitted that he had. And it turns out that Fua had, had a girlfriend who was a little blind girl who didn't, couldn't see him. He could, she couldn't see what he looked like. And, uh, and they were dating. And I was so touched by that story. Mm -hmm. You know, other people couldn't look at him because he looked like a monster to him, but this little girl became his girlfriend. And this man who entered his life, who saw the program, was going with him to buy a present for her. So I just, through the experiences like the two that I just uh, recounted, but others as well, I grew to realize the power of uh, documentaries. Let's, let's take a, another look at one of your films this, uh, from short stories. Mm -hmm. Look at this clip, and I think it's along this, this same kind of theme, and come back and talk about it.
like the temperature. <laughs> Steven. Hey, How you doing? Good. Good. Okay, take a good one. Well, I love them because they're my parents, because they raised me, they took care of me, they, they, they understand all the problems I went through, they were there for me in all the hard times. And also just an admiration of being able to go through life as a, as a short individual and having to deal with real life and people staring at you every day, every day having to go through people that are rude and considerate. Daddy! He said, your baby's a dwarf, and I just kind of zoned out, I think. I, I really don't know. I just know that um, the first thought that came to my mind was, what is a dwarf? Let's go! Come on! I used to have the feeling of, why did God put me in this situation? Why am I little? Why do people make fun of me? I, there, there became a point in my life where somehow I transferred the blame, and I stopped blaming myself, and I rose above that, and I tried to understand that the blame isn't with me. It's not my fault that people act the way they do. Robert, something about this lens that you have is really um, compassionate, and you're sort of, you've been talking about that up till now. Uh, how deliberate is that? I mean, is that this, this is sort of theme of, you know, you've, you worked with the Civil Liberties Union, and then you, you go into documentary filmmaking and you pick these stories, but you're able to show people from this really compassionate angle. It's not like you don't, you don't, you don't watch your films and feel pity for anybody, mm -hmm. um, but it's, a, it's what you were saying earlier, this kind of human, human side. Mm -hmm. Is that something you go into it and you're like, this is, this is how I'm gonna tell this story, or is it just so natural for you? Well, uh, I think that Part of the reason why I choose the topics I do is because it helps me sort of contextualize my own life a little bit better because uh, the people that I've chosen to, to look at, uh, the lives I've sort of chosen to uh, examine, are the lives of people who are marginalized in really severe ways through no, no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. And I learn uh, by looking into their lives so much more about other people and about my own life and about myself and it just helps me understand humanity a little bit better and uh, I you know I, I never really thought of it in terms of compassion uh, but I th think yes that it's there I hope it's there uh, because I don't like the idea of exploiting people uh, but I just think that there are, there are people who are so marginalized who are so invisible uh, to the rest of us uh, you know short statured people uh, the word, I mean, many people you prefer the word dwarf uh, who are part of that community. I don't like that word so much, but uh, are pretty much invisible. But when I did the piece, Short Stories, I went to uh, a convention in Indianapolis where I was surrounded by short people. Mm -hmm. I'd like towered above everyone, and I got a sense of what it felt like to be the outsider. Uh, and it's, I sort of like that. I like being the outsider and, under, and trying to understand what that means. Uh, so I think I'm drawn to the subjects that I uh, embrace uh, bec for, that, for that reason. You know, I want to show one more clip. You, I mean, you have so much work. It's like I feel like I could be here watching it all the time. But there's, I wanted to show one more clip specific to this. this is it goes a little bit back in time to like 1990, I think. But it was a series where you were doing these diary pieces. Um, and then you connected it with town hall conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but this segment we're gonna watch is specific to Native American uh, mm -hmm. culture and identity. Mm -hmm. And something that, I, that, sh that struck me about this is you let people present themselves. Right. And so you let uh, these Native American communities come off um, how they're gonna present themselves on camera. And so you let this sort of modern 
image come in that I think sometimes you might get resistance to. Like people don't want to see the modern image. They have a very specific <laughs> image that they want to see. Yeah, I can tell you some <laughs> stories about that piece. Um, let's, let's take a look at this clip. Okay. Today, there are 50,000 Native Americans in Minnesota, with 85% representing the Ojibwe tribe, 10% the Lakota, and the remaining 5% belonging to over 200 other tribes. An increasing number of these people have concluded that American society has done little to meet their moral and cultural needs, and they've chosen to go back to the traditions and values of their ancestors, like Joe Gishik, an artist whose studio is in the heart of downtown St. Paul. Joe's road to success as a painter was riddled with obstacles that he found difficult to overcome. 17 of his adolescent and adult years were spent in jails and prisons throughout the state. And it wasn't until much later in life that he finally realized the true source of his troubles. When I think back, when I was living up on, on the uh, Indian Reservation, uh, I remember us kids going out into the woods playing cowboys and Indians, and nobody really wanted to be the Indian. Everybody wanted to be the, uh, the cowboy. So Robert, this work that you do is, you know, a lot about trying to create voices for communities that traditionally don't have a voice um, or that it, their voice isn't necessarily heard in the mainstream media and I know now you've you've gone from producing a lot of this great work to helping others to produce work through your work with the Jerome Foundation mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about some of these ideas of 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 trying to support because um, the Jerome Foundation really supports people who are emerging that aren't traditionally in the film industry, um, are maybe telling stories that uh, aren't traditionally heard. Is there, you know, how do you see that relationship between the work that you were doing before and the work that you are able to do now with Jerome? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's, it's because of my great love of filmmaking that I uh, really uh, value the work that I do th uh, through Jerome. Jerome has a program both here in Minnesota and in New York City, so we fund filmmakers in, in both locations. Uh, and we, you know, we funded a lot of people who uh, are just sort of beginning to express their voice. Now, we don't fund beginners. We fund people who have a, a track record. So emerging does not mean beginning. It means someone who knows how to make a film. Uh, but a, a lot of the people we fund uh, have not really made names for themselves. And they're still discovering what, what their voice is. And for me, that's great because it reminds me of when I got started and what it meant to me to have the support of the man at Randall Coleman at Continental Cable that I told you about. So um, I just I feel that it, at this phase of my life, uh, it's now time to give something back and to, to help other voices uh, you know, reach their audiences and, and mature and grow and and uh, help uh, the public understand uh, whatever the issues are that these, these filmmakers care about. And I have to say that uh, you know some of the films that we've supported, especially through our New York program, have gone on to make a huge difference. Uh, a lot of the work in New York is by uh, filmmakers from other countries. And uh, has, uh, we've had uh, several uh, Oscar nominees. We've had an Oscar winner. Nice. Uh, and, uh, uh, films that have uh, gotten uh, many other awards uh, throughout the country and the world. So, and we're, tr we're really trying uh, in conjunction with other leaders here 
in the film community of uh, the Twin Cities especially, but also the state in general, to really build a stronger community here in the Twin Cities so that our, our uh, Minnesota filmmakers feel more supported and are doing stronger work and uh, start getting the same kind of attention that we're, the filmmakers in New York are receiving. Well, I mean, I definitely appreciate the work that Jerome does because it's it's needed and it just it makes such a different difference for the, these artists that decide that they have a distinct voice and they get a chance to play with it. So if, if and you're one of our grantees, aren't you? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> which is also part of why I really appreciate Jerome. But I, I, you know, for anybody that's watching this and they think that they, you know, have a project or they want to understand how Jerome could support them, where would they go to? We have but to call me. Uh, okay. That's another nice thing about Jerome. Uh, uh, people who want to inquire into what we do have direct access, uh, whereas uh, I, you know, you can't really say that about a lot of other foundations. But if they call, uh, they can speak to me directly or to uh, Rush Merchant, who's the assistant of the film and video program. Uh, so someone will always be there to talk to them. Well, I want to say, you know, it's, these shows are way too short for the conversation that I want to have with you. <laughs> But it's, it's a privilege to have you on the show, not only because of your, your amazing storytelling ability, but the way that you've been able to circle it back around and nurture a community here in the Twin Cities. I think it's, it's, it's an honor to be able to interview. So thank you very much for coming thank today. You. Thank you for watching this episode of Butter City, where it's a show all about filmmaking and all about Minnesota. Please stay tuned for more and check us out on Facebook or our website, www.buttercity.com.